Hello and welcome to episode 1 in the series on GPU programming. In this episode, we are going to discuss the key differences between the GPU and the CPU, how the architecture of the two differs, when to use one over the other, and finally, we are going to crack open the editor and write some code. What you are seeing right now on the screen is a highly simplified comparison of a CPU and GPU architectures. The real architectures are obviously much more complicated, but this simplification will help us understand the key differences. First of all, we can see that the GPU consists of a much greater number of cores, but that comes at a cost, as the CPU cores are much more capable. Secondly, the CPU has a much deeper memory hierarchy, effectively reducing the latency of memory access. Also, we can see that there are thread groups in the GPU that share the control units. That can point us to the fact that they all must execute exactly the same instruction at the same time. Let's put this comparison to actual numbers and compare my CPU which is a AMD Ryzen 3800X and my GPU, which is a GTX 3090Ti. My CPU has just 8 cores, compared to 10,752 cores in my GPU. It also has 32 MB of L3 cache that is not present in my GPU. It has 4 MB of L2 cache, whereas my GPU has 6 MB. But to be fair, each core has its own L2 cache, giving us 512 kilobytes per core. The GPU L2 cache is more similar in its structure to the L3 cache in the CPU because it's shared between the cores. But if we were to compare it with the CPU L2 cache, it would give us around 558 bytes per core. And finally, the CPU has 64 kilobytes of L1 cache per core, and the GPU has 128 kilobytes of L1 cache per streaming multiprocessor. You might wonder what this streaming multiprocessor thing is. We will discuss the details of it later, but for now, think of it as one row of connected cores in our diagram. In my GPU, a streaming multiprocessor consists of 128 cores, so that gives us one kilobyte of L1 cache per core. And both architectures have their advantages and disadvantages. They are just meant to solve completely different problems. I like to give an analogy that the CPU is like having 8 Albert Einsteins and the GPU is like having 10,752 average high school students. The CPU is optimized for running code that runs sequentially, minimizing the latency of the operations whereas the GPU is optimized for code that runs in parallel, maximizing the throughput. One such example of a highly parallelizable algorithm is vector addition. The way that you would typically do this on a CPU is to iterate over all of the values in our input vectors, add them together, and store them in the third vector. But we can clearly see that the output does not depend on any of the previous iterations. So what we want to do is just run everything in parallel. Here is the GPU code that lets us achieve this. First difference that we can notice is the global keyword. This is just an information to the compiler that this function is to be run on the GPU. Next difference is the index calculation instead of a for loop. Since the code will run in parallel, there will be multiple instances of the created, and everyone needs to be able to calculate which element in our vectors it is supposed to work on. The way CUDA achieves this is by using a concept of thread blocks. There will be a whole episode directed towards understanding them, but for now, you need to understand a few basic concepts. When we launch our kernel, we need to specify how many blocks we will launch and how many threads will each block contain. For example, 
when you launch n divided by two blocks, each containing two threads, here is how the structure of our blocks will look like. Each thread runs its own version of the code with the appropriate block index and thread index. Block dimensions are shared between the threads. It's left as an exercise to the watcher to verify that each thread will calculate a different index. The last difference is checking if our index is inside our vector. For example, if we had an uneven number of elements, the alignment of blocks might look like this, where the last thread in the last block would read and write out of bounds. The check simply ensures that we don't do that. Now that we have our kernel written, we actually need to run it. To do that, we need to first allocate the memory for our inputs and outputs on the GPU, and since the GPU cannot access the data in our RAM or on our hard drive, we need to copy our data from the CPU to the GPU. We can then run our kernel, copy the results back to the CPU to be able to read them, and free the memory on our GPU. Just a quick jargon checkup before showing you the code. CUDA refers to the GPU as the device and the CPU as the host. In order to allocate our memory, we need to first create a pointer, just like in regular C. The underscore D suffix is a common naming convention for marking pointers that are living on the device, so in our case the GPU. And then, again, similarly to C, we call the CUDA malloc function, passing in our pointer and the size that we want to allocate. Then, we have to move the data from the CPU to the GPU. Assuming that we already have our CPU pointers allocated, we just have to call the CUDA memcopy function. As arguments, we pass in the source pointer, the destination pointer, the size of the memory that we want to copy, and a marker indicating the type of the copy. In our case, we are copying from host memory to device memory, so from the CPU to the GPU. In order to run our kernel, we need to specify how many blocks we want to run and how many threads are there in each block. CUDA lets us configure this with the strange looking triple angle brackets. To cover the full span of our vector, we need to launch the minimum of n threads, so if each block consists of block size threads, the number of blocks would need to be the seeding division of n divided by the block size. Finally, we copy the result back to the CPU using the same function as before, but this time the destination pointer is the CPU pointer, the source pointer is the GPU pointer, and the direction is from device to host. What is left is to clean up our memory. We do that by calling the CUDA free function. Now, let's check what are the actual time differences when running our vector addition code on a GPU as opposed to the CPU. Here is a graph of the results for different input sizes. It's worth noting that the scale is logarithmic, so the ratios are much higher than they seem at first glance. If we were to graph the ratios, it turns out that our GPU code runs up to 180 times faster for big input sizes. And to be real with you, this kernel is just the simplest one to present. Since it does three memory accesses per one operation, it's not actually that much faster. We'll get into some kernels that get crazy improvements on the GPU. And if you want to see those, subscribe and stay tuned for the next episode.